Hello my lovely Floss Tube friends, welcome back to my channel, a warm warm welcome to you all. It's been a while hasn't it? In fact it's been more than a while, it's been a very long time. Um, and this is a very impromptu video um, of which I've got a very, when I say it's stitching, it's almost laughable the amount of stitching I haven't managed to achieve, but we all know why. I've been busy in the loft. I say it's a loft, it's not. The upstairs now, um, although there's no stairs yet, the upstairs has really come together and we've been super busy. Um, but there's also been some, some very, very um, sad news. So this is gonna be a hard video. But before we get to the really, really sad bit, I thought I'd better share what I have managed to do. Oh, you're gonna have to excuse me, people. I feel that my floss tube journey has always been me with my life. And the fact that a big part of my life has now gone. I need to be able to share that with you. Because otherwise I don't see how I can go forward making floss tube videos. But we'll talk about that in a little while. So let me just get myself together and control my emotions because I'm a very emotional person anyway. And let me show you some stuff. Okay, so now that I've had a sip of my coffee and I've controlled myself a little bit, and the reason for the glasses and this, this look is there's no makeup because it's likely to all fall off my face by the end of this video at some point. And I can't keep reapplying my makeup to make it look like I haven't done that. You've always all, all been there for me, so it only makes sense that I share the juicy bits, the fun bits, the sad bits, the, the reconstruction, development bits. So yeah, you get it all. So warts and all, everyone. So before I start, back a, well, quite a while ago, there was a lovely lady that sent me an email um, and said, Teresa, can I have your address? I've found these, um, these stitching books um, on like a, I think it's like a, I don't know, like a bargain, a bargain thing. Um, she said that I think you might quite like. So anyway, I sent her my address. I didn't hear from her for, for some time, so I was thinking, oh, maybe, maybe it didn't pan out. Um, and then, surprise, surprise, I got a lovely, a lovely parcel turn up in the, um, in the post from the lovely Jenny. I'm sure she won't mind me saying who she is. Just saying, I love watching your videos. Um, I would listen to you talk about anything. Well, it's a good job because today you are going to get everything. My heart, soul and everything. Um, I have laughed and cried with you. Well, we might be doing a bit of that as well today. Um, enjoy the patterns, Jenny. So, lover, she sent me some of these magazines. So I've got Cross Stitch and Country Crafts magazine. And there are some lovely patterns in these. So we've got that one. I can't show you because most of them have actually got the pattern. So I can't really show, oh I don't, well I can show you that one. So Dawn Lewis. See? Some really beautiful and they've got all the specialty stitches in. I do an eyelets, satin stitch, cross stitch, yeah. Then there's another cross stitch and country crafts. Um, July, August, 1995. And again, wow, that is wow. Look at that. So yeah, so there's definitely some patterns in there that I could try turning my hand to. Oh, some Christmas stockings. I think I'm a little early for Christmas though. I think Christmas is, Christmas is a way off, people. And then the last one was um, Cross Stitch and Country Crafts. God, 1986. Wow. It's like a vintage. And again, there's some lovely patterns in there. 
but this one I can't show you any of the actual patterns because you can only see the patterns without showing you the picture. I'm not allowed to show you the pattern, so. Apart from that one, that one's nice. I do like that one. So yeah, so thank you ever so much, Jenny, and thank you ever so much for thinking of me. And I will definitely get, when I get five minutes to have a proper look through, um, yeah, I'll put those in my stash and have some extra stuff to stitch. So, but thank you so, so much. Um, like I said, on the stitching side, you all knew that I was so busy upstairs that the likelihoods of actually touching on any stitching was almost impossible. Um, and it has sort of been as I expected. There's been very little stitching taking place. Um, oh no, what is the, why have I got needles sticking out of everything? Wow, that's impressive, even for me. Um, oh, oh no. Oh, it's okay, it's not a needle. Um, so the one that I did do a spot of stitching on, of which I did do think that I'd done a bit of a stitch with me on this um, not so long ago. So it's Castles in the Air, where I've got pictures um, of where you last, sorry, I'll put those in, but to be honest, um, I'm not necessarily sure I'm going to find that information, not today. So, here is where it's at, and the bit that I've been working on, or was working on, is this bit over here. So I think I've done like a bit of a stitch with me on this bit, and then this bit down here is what I've managed to get done. But like I say, everything at the moment is token gesture. And this was literally if I had a few minutes, but because I had my head all about upstairs, it's like even when I was trying to stitch, I was still thinking upstairs, or I had been upstairs all day and was so tired that I'd do like 10 stitches and then be like, I haven't even got the brain power for just standard stitching, so I'm just going to put it down and just rest. So yeah, so I've done very little, um, but... Obviously, with unlocking starting to happen here in the UK, um, hubby, as like racing season, has just started to reopen, but not true races, sort of some practice days. So there's been a couple of, like, well, actually, I think there's only been one. There was one Saturday or Sunday um, that he turned around and said, I'm not doing any building work, Teresa. I'm going to go off to the racetrack and just take my mind off the build because it was getting a little bit... It was getting, yeah, it was absorbing us and, you know, we was at loggerheads with each other because the stress of it all um, and the sheer amount of work that was, that was happening, there was, it was all work and no play. So the agreement was he would go off and do some racing and I would sit and either rest my weary bones and spend a bit of time, you know, doing bits in the garden if the weather allowed um, and if I fancied it, a bit of stitching. So... I pulled out and put on the stand my chatelaine because I thought well at least with the chatelaine there's like bits of it that I can do tiny little chunks of it will still be making progress because every stitch is progress um, but I don't feel like I need to do a massive great block to actually have it look like you've done something although arguably you could say that it doesn't actually look like I've done much of anything but hey it is what it is isn't it as my mum would say. Um, so let me see if I can sort now. It's going to look a bit of a mess because there's all these hanging threads because I've been a bit lazy with it. <laughs> but the bit that I decided to work on, because obviously I think I already had, I think I already had the lanterns and I was like, right, now I need to start on the snow on this side and start on the trees. And I thought, well, because you can do 10, 15 stitches and then stop, and then 10, 15 more stitches and stop, this would be the perfect, this would be the perfect project. So, so yeah, so I've done the snow. Yes, I have. So I've done the snow all the way along here and I've started on the trees and I finished the last of the lanterns on this side. So, so yeah. If I don't start doing some of the trees, the trees are going to become overwhelming. I know they are. Um, so I was like, well, whilst I've got time to just do bits and pieces as and when I feel like it, 
they're like the perfect choice rather than having say a hide or a full coverage piece out where you know that really I like to make sure that I get a 10 by 10 block which would mean 100 stitches I need to allocate 100 stitches and to be honest with life how it's been recently there just hasn't been the time and even when there has been the time I haven't wanted to because it's just I'm so tired and when I'm not I mean literally a day would normally be this is this is how the days are going so on a, on a work day it would be get up at six in the morning do a bit of housework maybe pop out and do a bit of a walk or a bit of exercise in the morning like a bit of keep fit pop into the garden open the greenhouse give everything a water start work spend the day working five o'clock down stop work or well, to be honest most days I've been working till sort of half five six six thirty then it was take the dog out for a walk come back go upstairs work again with Darren doing manual labor and the, the roof um, until about half seven eight o'clock come back down Dal would go off to the gym um, and at that point, I'd just collapse in a heap on the sofa and, and have cuddles with fudge. So that was a work day. And then on the weekends, the weekends, even if Darren was working on a Saturday morning, I would be out doing all the running around, picking up all the stuff from the building merchants um, and taking the deliveries. And then literally go upstairs and be up there all day long. And then we weren't coming back down until six, seven o'clock at night taking fudge out for a walk so that's like nine o'clock at night before we even sort of thought about food or sitting down so yeah you can see how you know life has just gone racing past and and not much stitching or actual time has been happening so needless to say the upstairs is coming along lovely um we're getting very close to the finish line um, and if I've got some pictures I'll be putting them in here. So the main shell is created and the space is created. Um, we've done we've done one part of the roof completely with the uh, like a gable end. Um, we're just in the middle of doing the tiling up the front up to the two front dormers um, and we've tiled some of the back around the big dormer. Um, the renderers have been and had a little look at the job and they've said because they're so busy until June, July time, but we do have that big metal top hat on top of the house, um, that if they have rainy days, then we're the perfect job. So although they don't really have any bookings available till June, July, if they get rained off of other projects or other, other jobs, then they'll come to us. Which, up until now, the UK has had very little amounts of rain. Well, here in the sunny south, anyway. It's not been sunny, um, but it's not been wet at all. So, I was like, you know, we paid all this money for this big scaffolding and top hat, and it hasn't rained. But this weekend and all next week, by the looks of it, it's going to do nothing but chuck it down. And it's, it, true to word, it has been raining for the last... For the last three days ish it's it's been rainy days so we've got so we basically said well the gable end and the rear dormer and the front dormers we need to get them to the point that we're ready for rendering so that's the membrane needs to go on um the metal mesh needs to go on um, and the fascias and soffits need to go on so that they can just come in put their beadwork up and then do the plaster like do the rendering um, so the gable end, the big, the big triangle at the end, that is now all meshed. So if if they get rained off of any jobs and they want a job to come and do, that is at the ready. And I think this week we're planning to have the two front dormers and the rear dormers ready um, for the renderers to come in as and when they get a bit of time as well. So so yeah, so we're we're sort of getting there. The skylight has arrived. That's been put in. We're still waiting for the Velux windows for the front. They haven't turned up yet. And obviously the doors and windows still haven't turned up. And at this rate, there's such a delay on them that I don't think we're actually going to get them whilst we've still got the scaffolding. I think we're going to have to board up the holes and take the scaffolding down and just put the windows in when they turn up. So, so yeah, there's been a few issues with sort of the logistics 
and the timings of deliveries versus when we're ready for it because ideally you want your doors and windows in before you do your rendering um, but with such a delay on the doors and windows I don't think we can afford to be picky so we might just have to roll with the rendering um, and like I say take the scaffolding down um, before the doors and windows turn up so so there's still there is still a lot to do and like I said we was only doing it to get us watertight it was never about doing the inside yet because the summer is coming supposedly that's what they keep telling us they keep telling us the summer is coming haven't seen it yet but when it does I don't want to be up there doing plasterboarding and partition walls and electrics and plumbing and no so I said to my husband, this is a luxury, not a necessity. Once we get this water tight, I said, and the good weather turns up, we down tools. I said, and we wait until the summer is over and we go back to, you know, not such nice weather. And, you know, at times, outside at, at time is, is less and then we'll go back up and do. Oh, and as I said, we, we could, you know, here in the UK, we don't have seasons like other parts of the world so where you get sort of like if it's summer you get like no rain no bad days we get into me and we can have like a week a week 10 days of rain cloud and miserable weather in which case there'll be the days that we go up and do bits and pieces on the inside so so yeah it may get done a bit more than we think through the course of the summer but if we have a nice summer then it won't um so yeah, so the, the roof is coming on, and like I say, where I've had pictures, you've either seen them or I will be showing you them. Um, oh, my phone keeps going off, people. Oh yes, light rain starting in grey. So today it's supposed to be torrential downpours. At this point, we are super grateful for the overhead, for the overhead thing, for the uh, scaffolding tin roof. There's, um, yeah, it's, it's earning its money now, that's for sure. So... Um, so for the sad news, for those of you that are connected to me on Facebook, you will already know. Um, now see, a lot of people that don't have pets are not going to understand this part of the video. Because they're like, well, you know, he's just a pet. But for me, he was everything. So when we lost Chester, I think four years ago, or possibly five years ago, that was hard enough. But Chester was a different little soul. So I had two dogs, and they were all more about themselves, like together. They were, they were, they were almost like, they would cuddle up together. Um, and Chester was always, you know, he loved us, but he didn't want to didn't sit on you. He didn't want to sit next to you. He just needed to be in the same room to know that you're there. Um, but he wasn't overly, overly bothered by cuddles and, you know, loving and, and those sorts. And he never played ball because that wasn't his bag. You know, if I threw a ball, he'd look at me as a seller. I don't actually expect me to go and get that, do you? Um, but he was all very much about food. But he was an independent little doggy. So when we lost Chester, that was heartbreaking enough. Um... But we still had Fudge, and Fudge at the time was about six or seven years old. So he was still relatively young and full of beans and wanted to do lots of stuff. So we managed to sort of, you know, funnel ourselves into Fudge because because there were so many things that we could do now. You know, because Chester, both, both the dogs had um, heart problems, but Chester obviously went into full heart failure at the age of 10. Um... Um, even the build up to that he, he struggled he struggled with his breathing he struggled to be able to go for a walk um, he was very lethargic he spent a lot of time sleeping because he got worn out very quickly so the problem with that was although Chester did like to go out he could only really make it to the top of the road and back whereas obviously Fudge was all young and springy wanted to go for a walk but then it was it was a nightmare because you try and get you try and take one without the other so to try and get Fudge out of the house without Chester knowing, Chester would then sit and cry because he wanted to go. So then you would try and take them both, but Chester could only make it to the top of the road. Fudge is pulling, like, come on, mum, let's go a bit further. And, and Chester was just like, I can't go any further, and would sit down. So 
when we was at that point where we had the two, they didn't want to be separated and Fudge never really wanted to go for a walk without Chester. Um, but then Chester couldn't do it. So we sort of didn't take them for very many walks or if we did, it was literally to the top of the road and back, which really wasn't enough for Fudge. Um, but obviously Fudge was all about the ball and he was all about playing. So, you know, we could run him ragged in the garden just by throwing the ball and playing catch with him. Um, and Chester was just quite happy to just sort of lay out on the deck. Um, so obviously when we lost Chester, it, although it was heartbreaking, we still had fudge. So my main, my main sort of concern when we lost Chester was although I missed him, it was, is fudge going to pine for him? So we sort of said, well, this gives us the opportunity to, you know, do all the things with fudge that we couldn't do before and make sure that he doesn't miss Chester so much. So Kuss, at that point, it was like, you know, you'd go for a walk in the morning and then we'd go for a walk in the evening and we'd play lots of ball and... You know, and then obviously because Fudge didn't have Chester to curl up with, he became very cuddly with me. Um, obviously at the time I was a bit unwell. I'd been spending, God, nearly a year at home. Spending all that time at home with, with the dogs. Um, and then obviously I started to go back into the city. Um, but then I felt guilty because it was like, well, I was going all day and Fudge was so attached to me more so than anyone else. Darren obviously has always gone off and done his racing. He's always gone to the gym in the night times. Um, and yes, he would sit and give him cuddles, but Darren would always be coming and going. Lauren, Lauren was obviously working and college and you know what kids are like, they hide away in their bedroom. So again, she wasn't around him all the time, but for me, I was Fudgy's person, I suppose, because I was always there other than when I was at work. So even when I wasn't at work, or if I had a chance to go out after work, I always used to say no, because I always felt bad that I'd left Fudge. And I'd come home and then, you know, take him out for a walk. But then when I sat down and done my stitching, which was almost every night um, and every weekend, it was me and Fudge. So Fudge loved that because mummy was just sat, you know, and all the time I was just sitting there stitching, he was, lounging all over me you know and wanted cuddles and every now and then we'd go out in the garden and we'd stretch our legs together and yeah he'd trample all my flowers and piss up everything <laughs> but because I was always at home other than at work and all of my hobbies were home based it was me and Fudge all the time and wherever I went he went then obviously Covid hit so then I wasn't going anywhere and I was at home 24-7 and obviously, I'm, I'm the sort of person, really, everyone would think that I'm a really social, you know, want to be out, you know, chatting and meeting and greeting people. I'm not. I am like a, a little misfit. I, I like to be at home. I like to, well, I've always liked to be at home. I like to be able to do my hobbies. My hobbies are at home. You know, my gardening is at home. The greenhouse is at home. Um, my mum is at home at my house. Well, she's not, she's in her, her house, but in the same plot. Um, my stitching. So yeah, everything has always been about being at home. Then obviously COVID happened. So then I was, I didn't even have to go to work. I was working from home. So, cause I was always in the study. So again, me and Fudge, we had, we had a routine. We had a routine of, you know, daddy would get up in the morning, make the coffee, Fudge would walk to the door, turn around, look at me as if to say, don't actually think you're just going to lay there, right? You need to come and let me out. So I'd let him out, he'd go for his wee, he'd come back, I'd give him his heart medication. Then we would jump back in bed together and he would lounge all over me whilst I was sitting there watching Floss Tube. And we'd lay there for about half an hour before I got up. I'd come out, I'd do my keep fit in the morning. He'd sit on the chair watching me as if to say, that looks far too energetic, mummy. Um, and then as soon as I'd had my shower, of which Chris Fudge joins me in the bathroom and would lay on the mat, then we would go into the study and then Fudge would resume position in one of his two little beds. And that would be, that would be the day. The day would be him and me in the same room. Every now and then he'd get a little stroke. Um... We'd do bits and pieces, you know, go in the garden, stretch our legs at lunchtime. And then about quarter to five, he would, he would start making, making the right moves at sort of hovering around the door as if to say, come on, it's got to be that time, mum. It's 
got to be that time. We're going for a walk now, right? We're going, yeah? We're going. So, Kirst, then I'd be like, okay, okay, we're going for a walk. And Kirst, Fudge didn't want to walk locally at all. And there's not really any, I mean, not that he likes parks. He hates parks. He never really liked other dogs because he was frightened of them. And the fact that he was totally deaf made it even more difficult for him. Um, so he didn't like, he loved people, but he, di he didn't like dogs. He wasn't aggressive. He was just, he would care away from them. So with the fact that we had the whole lockdown and lots of people were out walking and pavements over here are not particularly wide, I thought, well, the best place to take him is to sort of like a retail park where there's very few people, big, big pavements. Um, so that's what I used to do. So we used to jump in the car, which Fudge loved to go in the car, and we would drive over to Lakeside to our local shopping centre and I would just walk him around the retail park. And he absolutely loved it. He used to get so excited about his walk on the retail park. So that was, that was how things were. And it's been like that for over a year. Um, and even with doing the loft, you know, he would be a bit depressed. You could see, it was like, as if to say, like, you're not going back up there again, are you, Mum? Because, like, I'm stuck down here. And every now and then, like, I would, I'd stand at the top of the scaffolding and I'd look down and he'd be on the pathway in the garden looking up as if to say, like, what are you doing up there? <laughs> so, yeah, so as you can imagine, I have spent almost every waking minute with Fudge for, well, just over a year now, over a year, since lockdown started. Um, so, yeah, he was my shadow and he always was my shadow. You know that because of the videos. The videos, he was always with me and especially when I'm stitching um, which I think is what made my stitching experience so much nicer was because I wasn't just sitting there stitching on my own he was always lounging either lounging next to me or under my stitching so that his head was under the stitching or across my lap but either way he had to be touching me um, and that's how it's always been But unfortunately, um, we lost Fudge the day before yesterday. And surprisingly enough, not to heart failure, like I thought I would. So back last week, Thursday, Friday, he started showing signs of not wanting to eat. At first, I thought he was just being fussy and wanted human food and not his dog food. Um, but then it came, became clear that it wasn't that. He just, he just didn't want to eat because we were starting to try and give him chicken and he didn't want to eat the chicken, which is like, well, you, if you've got dogs, you know it's a rarity for them not to want to eat the chicken. Um, so because um, I, I was a bit like, I have no idea what's going on. So when I looked in his little mouth and I pulled his little lips up, I realised that all of his gums were really sore and they're really red and inflamed. So I took him to the vets and the vets are like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe he's got, you know, toothache, which was a bit worrying anyway because when you've got a dog with you know in full full stage heart failure um as a general rule they won't give them a general anesthetic um because the likelihoods of them pulling back round from the general anesthetic are very slim so i was sort of a little concerned because i was thinking well if he needs any teeth out we're gonna have to run the risk that we put him under a general and he won't wake back up but it is what it is, you know, if he's got sore teeth, and you can't, I can't make him suffer. I mean, both me and my husband said when we knew that he was in the full stage heart failure, that there was only a few things that, there were criterias that needed to be met. So the one was that he would never be in pain and would never make him suffer. And it was all about his quality of life. Because I said, if he can't enjoy his food, enjoy his walks with his ball in his mouth, and play a little bit of ball, then that isn't quality of life for him. Chester's quality of life was completely different because Chester wasn't really into balls and wasn't really into walking. So for him, quality of life was as long as he could eat and sleep and be comfortable, he was fine. Fudge, on the other hand, was a much more active dog, so therefore there was a different criteria for him because he would get depressed if you didn't take him for a walk. Even, even if it was absolutely peeing down with rain one day and you're like, Fudge, I can't take you out, darling, because it's just too rainy. It's, it's raining far too hard. He would sigh and sit by the front door sighing. He's just like, please, can we go out? So this was it. It was all about quality of life. So 
obviously the fact that he couldn't eat and we took him to the vets um, and she said that does seem a little bit odd she went I'll just check his temperature and when she checked his temperature she was like oh then we found out that he had an abscess around his near his bottom um, which was really quite big but he hadn't made any you know he hadn't let me know that he had it there was no pain it just seemed a bit odd that he didn't even let us know that it was there. So, because then it was like, well, maybe this and that is like, there's a bit of an infection going on. Um, so anyway, we ended up at the, wet, the vets on the Friday. Then he got an abscess on his foot on the Saturday. He started chewing his paw off. Then we ended up at the vets again on the Sunday, because by this point he's really starting to deteriorate. And I said, you know, something really doesn't seem quite right here. This isn't, and he didn't seem himself. Um, so eventually, um, Monday I didn't take him to the vets and I just let him stay at home. I couldn't get him to eat. I think he had like a couple of handfuls of chicken, but it had to be sort of in the tiniest bit ever. And he wouldn't take it out of a bowl. He would only take it if you put it in his mouth. Um, so I was like, something's really not right. So then by the Tuesday, obviously the fact that he'd gone from sort of Thursday to Tuesday without really eating anything, he was just wasting away, love him, because he's small. Um... We had no choice but to put him in the vets. The vets agreed that something wasn't right. We tried him on antibiotics at home and painkillers, but where he wasn't eating anything, it then upset his tummy. So then you'd try and give him his antibiotic, his painkiller. They're saying that certain ones needed to be with food, so obviously he couldn't have the ones that weren't with food because he wasn't eating enough. Um, and the ones that they said should have been okay for his tummy, which was basically the painkillers, because I sort of said, if I can have painkillers to make him eat, then he'll eat, then I can give him his antibiotic. But the problem was he, he couldn't keep anything down then because the painkiller basically upset his tummy and the next thing you know, we were out in the garden for like two hour stints with him just being sick or having the other problem. Um, so yeah, so it, it really did not go in a particularly good way. So then I spoke to the vets and the vets said, I think we need to bring him in. And I sort of said, I agree. Because when I took him into the vets, although he was sick, he wasn't sick sick, you know, he was still fairly alert, um, fairly with it. And they sort of said, well, maybe if we give him IV painkillers and IV antibiotics, it will pep him up and maybe we'll get him to eat. So that was the plan. They said they couldn't get him to eat. And in the end, they said, well, look, we're thinking we might do a bit of a heart scan and we'll do a tummy scan because, you know, we're not sure that he hasn't got a problem with his tummy now. So we was like, okay, you know, I didn't want to submit him to anything more than he needed to be submitted to, but I'm like, well, we, we need to know what's going on. Um, so he had the heart and tummy scan, and then the vets called me and said, yeah, there seems to be something not quite right in his tummy. Um, his spleen's enlarged, he's got lesions on his spleen, he's got nodes on his spleen. Um, I think we need to do aspiration. So I was like, well, she said, do you think? And I was like, well, there's obviously something going on and we need to know what we're dealing with. So I, I suppose so, yeah, do that. So because they'd done the aspiration, that was on the that was on the Tuesday late afternoon, early evening. Um, she rung me back up and said, oh, we've done it. And she said, now, the question is, she said, are you happy to have him home? Do you think you might be able to get him to eat something? Because we still haven't achieved to get him to eat. So I was like, yeah, I said, well, I said, I honestly didn't think he was that sick or, or sick enough to be in the vets anyway. I said, it was just that I needed to get to the bottom of, you know, actually getting some painkillers and antibiotics into him. So she said, well, you know, well, he's, he's a bit docile. She said, but yeah, she said, let's, let's try him at home and see how he gets on. And hopefully we'll have the aspiration test, like the results back, like the day after or the day after that. Well, I'm expecting to get Fudge back in the same sort of condition that he was in when I dropped him off and he wasn't he wasn't at all he had deteriorated so badly at first I thought it was where he'd had like a slight sedation so that they could do the scans and then I realised that it wasn't that um, so I brought him home on the Tuesday night or was it the Wednesday night I can't remember what day it is now um, but anyway I brought him home that night I was up with him all night I even crawled into his big dog bed with him with a pillow and a cover. And Fudge has always wanted cuddles and always wanted to be as close as possible to you when he wasn't very well. And he, he was all over the place. In the end, he, you know, he went out in the hallway. 
and then he went and curled underneath like a cupboard in the living room and then he was standing there staring at the wall just staring at it and then he was like flopping on the floor so I could tell you know it was it was really not looking very good and he was and like I said we promised that we would never make him suffer anything um, so all night I stayed with him and just followed him around the house and you know, tried to stroke him, tried to keep him as comfortable as I could, but he wasn't comfortable and he was in pain. You could tell he was in pain. And then my husband, then he'd crawled back in his bed and I sort of went and got back in our bed. Um, and my husband got up to go to work. And my husband, whenever he gets up for work, as fudge has never failed. So when Darren gets out of bed in the morning, fudge always looks up at him and then wags his little towel. And this is the first time since we've ever had fudge that he didn't lift his head up he did look at him and he didn't wag his towel so that sort of told us all that we needed to know so then that morning a few hours later when I tried to get him to eat thinking you know maybe if I can get some food into him he'll, he'll pep up I um, knew that I couldn't we sort of knew so I rang my husband and said I need to take him back to the vet and I think this is it my husband agreed you know as as owners of pets, although the vets say, well, you know, let's try this and let's try that. I was like, we're not doing that. We promised him that we would never make him suffer. And as far as I'm concerned, he is truly suffering now. Um, and the fact that we can't get him to eat, I was like, that, that's the catalyst, especially in a dog that's got heart failure. Um, and to the point he wouldn't even take his heart meds. He's been taking his heart meds for like four to six years without any problems whatsoever and I had to force it down his mouth and when I tried to open his little mouth he was really restricted it was almost like his mouth only wanted, well, only wanted to open that much you really didn't want you to try and touch his mouth so I knew there was something really quite bad going on um, so anyway the whole family me Darren or well, Darren met us there from work uh, Lauren and Ben came with us we took him there on a blanket and he wouldn't move and I turned around and said to them, look, we can't, we can't do this, you know. We, we knew we was on borrowed time with him because they already said he was in full heart failure over a year ago, um, or about a year ago, or well, eight months ago, and they told us you'd get about a year <clears throat> to 18 months. But then with this and the fact that it happened so quickly, so from the Thursday to the, well, it was a week, Thursday to like the Wednesday, Thursday, um, it was, yeah, to the Wednesday, he just plummeted and he was so unwell that we sort of said like no we need to do the right thing by him so we sent fudge on his forever sleep and it was done lovely because of covid believe it or not you know you now when you sit there and think well you know covid ruins has ruined a lot of people's lives and it's ruined a lot of things but for us it worked because fudge was an outside dog fudge was all about being outdoors playing with his ball the thought of sending him into the vets for them to put him through his forever sleep and we weren't allowed in there was just... So I sort of said, well, look, if we have to do it in the car. And she was like, no, no, no. She said, we've got like an outside garden we could do it in if you're happy to do that. She said, we'll just take him in, put the little thing in. She said, and then take him out to the garden and call you in. So we went into this little garden thing out the back, which was lovely. And as soon as he see us, he was like, oh, they're here. They haven't left me at the vets. Um... He looked at everyone, which was one of the other things. When you've got a dog that's, that's deaf, my fear, because of the way heart failure can take a dog, they slowly become really oxygen deprived. So they don't really know where they are or what's going on is how it tends to happen. Um, well, that's how it happened with Chester at least. Um, and at that point they say their last sensory to go is their hearing. And when I lost, well, when, when we had to have Chester put to sleep, by the time we actually got him to the vets and to the point that we could, we could, you know, ease the pain and, and let him go off to sleep, he was already not really aware of where he was or what was going on. But the one thing that they said was, because when they brought him back in the room, I was like, there's my boy. And he wagged his little towel. And they said, he doesn't really know what's going on and he doesn't really know where he is. They said, but obviously he can hear you and that's why he's wagging his tail. So he does know you're there. Now, obviously, we knew that because Fudge was deaf, that 
we had to be a bit more mindful of that because we didn't want Fudge to think we weren't there if he was not really aware of what was going on. So it was very important for us So it was really important for us to know that he knew we was there. And it couldn't have been more perfect. He knew we were there because he was he was alert. I mean, he was he was suffering and he was in pain. He was panting. But he was like, hello, mummy. Hello, daddy. Hello, Lauren. And hello, Ben. So we all sat around him. I sat in front of him and held his little hand, held his head in my hands. And stroked him underneath his chin. And he went off for his forever sleep, which is beautiful because he knew we was all there and we didn't make him suffer. I did say we wouldn't get through this video without me tearing, didn't I? I did say that. So we've sent him fudge off for his forever sleep in such a lovely way, outside where he wasn't frightened that he was in the vets. Um, he had everyone with him. It was, it was very nicely done. Um, and I have no regrets because it was the right thing to do by him. Um, and believe it or not, I mean, <laughs> the ironic part of it was, was Although I didn't have any regrets, you sort of sit in there thinking, did we do the right thing? Even though you know you did the right thing, you questioned, did we do the right thing? And it was like, oh, no, because we, we said he was never to suffer. Especially with the fact that he had heart failure and was on borrowed time anyway. It was like, it's the right thing to do. You know, with him not eating and not eating for that long, basically almost a week without eating, um, his heart would have given up anyway. His heart would have given out. So... You know, we said, like, well, we, we, we felt in our heart of hearts that it was right. He was telling us he'd had enough. Um, but then I got a phone call. So the same day, I mean, that day was so difficult because I couldn't be, I wanted to be anywhere but here, believe it or not. There was every reminder. And deathly quiet, which it still is, which is why I think I'm still struggling, which I know it's only days... And I know it's supposed to get easier. Um, but yeah, it's really hard. The fact that he was always with me. You know, it didn't matter where I was or what I was doing. Working, stitching, gardening, sleeping. If I had an afternoon nap, I loved it when mummy had an afternoon nap. Um... So yeah, so for me, I'm really struggling to be here because it's just empty for me. Um, but anyway, the surprisingly enough, at about four o'clock that same day, I'd, I was upstairs. I mean, I, I was useless. I was just standing around crying. Um, but at least I was on the roof. I'd never associate fudge with the roof because he was never up there. So for me, it was uh, at least I'm not downstairs. Um, Darren was absorbing himself because that's how he sort of deals with these things is, is absorb your brain, you know, don't think about it. Um, so he was busy working and I was just like passing things to him in between lots of sprinkling eyes. Um, but then a phone call came from the vets and she said, look, Teresa, she said, I'm ever so sorry. She said, I don't know if this is too soon, she said, or whether this is actually going to give you a bit more peace of mind that you, you did the right thing. She went, we, we've had his aspiration results back. And she said, uh, she said if you had any, any thought or fear that you'd done the wrong thing, she went, let me reinforce to you, you didn't. Um, she said, poor little fudgy had lymphoma, uh, one of the aggressive ones. So basically, if left untreated, he only had three or four weeks to live anyway. All of the treatments weren't an option for him because he was in heart failure. And he must have already had it for about three weeks-ish because he'd lost some of his fur on the front of his mouth. Um, and with the lesions and the nodes and the, sort of the, the symptoms that were showing, apparently this is the type of um, cancer that progresses without any signs or symptoms until it's already in late stage 
Um, she said so to be honest she said he only had a matter of days left anyway um, she said so you just eased that I mean it has helped it has helped massively to know that not not that I needed it reinstating but you know when it's like we knew something was seriously wrong we knew that the likelihoods of him bouncing back from it were like almost zero but for me it was more like no suffering key most important no suffering um so yeah so it, it has helped um but it's not helping now with being at home because right now home is the last place i want to be so i told you this was going to be a video that included sadness and tears but i needed to tell you all and you'd think that I could do this without bursting into tears, but I can't because I'm very emotional and I miss him dearly. Um, but there is a, a problem. It doesn't sound like a problem, but it, there's... The problem I've got is obviously right now, right here right now, I mean, I know everyone's going to tell me it gets easier and it does get easier. I know it does. Um, but right here right now, I never want to be indoors. I don't want to be indoors because it's too quiet. It's too quiet. The routine is wrong. Everywhere I look, it's wrong. And every time I sit down, it's wrong. So my concern right here, right now, is I've totally lost my stitchy bug. And I can't bear the thought of doing any stitching because it's not going to be there. It's not going to be either under the stitching or sidled up next to me. Because in between stitches, this is it. Only people that have little dogs or dogs that they pet while they're stitching or they have like a, a stitching companion would appreciate what I'm saying. But... You do a bit of stitching and you'll have your floss tube on or you have your telly on and then every now and then they'll have a little shuffle next to you and you automatically by a total habit just put your hand down and give them a little give them a little stroke either whilst you're talking or whilst you're looking at like what you're going to do next or whilst you're watching a bit of the telly and then you go back to your stitching but it's like a therapeutic thing you sort of stitch a bit stroke a bit stitch a bit stroke a bit those that have got what I call lap pets would know exactly what I'm talking about right now. Um, and that's not there. Even to the point that I've got a big chair that I've always sat to the, to the right because Fudge would always sit to the left. And I'm still finding that I'm going to sit on the chair to the right. And I'm like, but I still can't bring myself to sit in the middle or land across it. So, although I'm busy on the roof, and I said to my husband, you know what, we could, I said this roof couldn't have come at a better time, because when that space is created up there, we're going to have no association to fudge. It's not like every time I look in a corner, or I look in a place, I'm going to be thinking, oh, fudge used to do this. Oh, fudge would be there, because that's basically what's happening at the moment here. So because at the moment, I mean, like last night, for instance, I finished work, I went up on the roof with Darren. Again, I was not really that helpful because I was still like a water squirter, like a sprinkler system. Because it does. I mean, I, I'll be fine and I think I'm fine and I'm not thinking anything. And then all of a sudden the sprinkler system turns on and yeah. I mean, I haven't been, I haven't been able to wear contact lenses for days now because... Every time I wear my contact lenses, they go all murky if you try and cry in them. So I have to wear my glasses. It's the only way at the moment. Um, I mean, we came down from, from upstairs last night. And I'd already been out for a run in the morning because I found it too difficult in the morning to get up and he wasn't there. So I thought, well, I'll go for a run. I don't associate the dog with the run. So I'll go for the run. And even, even then... I was running around, crying my eyes out. Because 
everywhere that I was running, it was like, oh, Fudge liked that corner. Fudge liked that. Fudge went there. Oh, I remember when Fudge did this. So, because all these tears are streaming. All these people are watching me running, and I'm running. And I've got tears streaming down my face, and you can see them looking at me as if to say, wow, girl, if that, if that runs that hard, you really should stop. <laughs> so, yeah, I was just like, dear God, what do I look like? So, and even when I come home, because whenever I used to go out for a run or a walk in the mornings, um, Fudge would lay, because he can't hear and deaf, he would lay by the front door. So that, that way, if you come in the door, he'd feel the door move so that he knew you was back. So whenever you came in the door, you had to sort of literally put the key in the door and then just give the door a little, a little nudge for him to wake up enough to realise you're coming in the door. And then he'd move out of the way and be like, hello, mummy. Because I'd done exactly the same thing. Even though I knew he wasn't there. But yet, it's just like autopilot. You do these things. So obviously, my only concern now is the fact that I don't want to be at home. And like last night, I had the opportunity to sit down in front of the TV, and let Darren go to the gym and for me to maybe sit and attempt to do some stitching or watch TV or just do something, I didn't. I went out. I went, I went to the gym with him because I wanted to be anywhere but here. And then this weekend, so, you know, we're going to work on the roof this afternoon, but tomorrow Darren's going racing all day, which would be the day normally that I would be like, well, that's fine because the UK weather this week is atrocious and it's supposed to do nothing but rain. Perfect day to sit in and do some stitching and watch a bit of floss tube and I can't think of anything worse right now. So I can't even bring myself to do my stitching. So I think what I'm trying to tell you is please don't be worried or, or concerned if you don't see some videos of me returning to stitching straight away. Because um, I have a very sneaky suspicion that my, my stitchy bug might wane somewhat at the moment because my association with stitching was me and my stitching buddy and without a stitching buddy it's almost yeah it just makes it worse but like i said i know everyone keeps telling me it gets easier and i can't believe i'm devoting this almost this entire video to the sad news of losing my my lovely poochie fudge um but although it's sad now for me to be trying to consider how we go forward you know and how do I you know carry on being me and doing all the things that I love to do without him I would never have been without him because yeah, we had 12 years of so much fun and you think I mean how many times on floss tube did you hear me go fudge don't do this fudge or fudge shush or you know he'd just pop up and be like oh has everyone seen fudge fudge was all about the stitching you know, and even when I was sitting here talking to this camera in this exact position, he would be sat directly opposite me on the sofa looking at me, like whilst hanging off the sofa, looking at me as just like, Mummy, what are you doing? Is, are you talking to me? Who are you talking to? <laughs> because he would never have understood what the camera was all about. But even so, um, yeah, Fudge. Fudge has been a massive part of my Floss Tube um, channel. Um, so the fact that I'm so sad to lose him, I needed to share that with you all because then you might understand that if you don't see any videos from me with any stitching, it's because I'm still adjusting. And I'm sure there will come a point that I will adjust enough that I will feel that I want to stitch. But right here, right now, I can honestly say I can't think of anything less that I would like to do because he's not around to do it with me. But yeah, so more of a just so that you know, people. Um, and anyway, the summer's coming. You know I always go on a bit of a hiatus for the summer, so maybe I'll just use my summer hiatus to get over the loss. Or not get over it, you don't ever get over it, but get past the worst of it, spend a bit of time in the garden and soaking up the sun, which yes, Fudge liked the sun, but he didn't like it that much. It got too hot. Thank you all ever so much for all the comments uh, from previous videos. Currently at the moment, I've been 
you know, with everything that's been going on with the roof and then now obviously with fudge, I haven't managed to answer everyone. Um, and I appreciate that people have asked me questions and I haven't answered or hearted. I only heart the ones where you've just said something, but you're not actually asking for a response from me. Um, I may even do that for people with the questions, just so that you know, I have read them, but right here, right now, I'm either not in the right place to answer anything, um, or have time. So, but I do really appreciate all of the lovely comments um, and all the lovely love that people always give me. And for those that have got questions, you know, by all means, ask the question, but I can't guarantee I'll get back to you with an answer straight away or, yeah, I will try, but I have to be honest, I'm fairly miserably at everything at the moment. Yeah, so, so yeah. So, thank you so much. And I'm sorry it was such a sad video and I'm sorry I went on so much about the sadness of losing Fudge, but Fudge is a huge part and always has been a huge part of my videos and um, my floss tube, that it would be wrong of me to just go, oh yeah, you know, we lost Fudge and then that's it because I think you need to see it as it is for me because this could impact the next few months as far as how much stitching I was going to get done because... The roof is almost done. We're almost at the point where we're gonna, you know, shut up shop and stop, get scaffolding down, which would then give me my time back to be able to do my stitching. And right here, right now, I can honestly say that I don't wanna do any of my stitching. I don't even wanna be in the house or anywhere that reminds me. So, so yeah, I'm sure it will get easier. I know it will get easier. Um, and we will have a new normal. I mean, timing probably couldn't come at a better time that the UK unlocks on Monday. So you, know, you can go to restaurants, you can go to bars. Not that I'm a restaurant, a bar person. And the last thing I want to do is eat right now. I can't think of anything worse. Um, but at least there's opportunities for me to go off out and not be sort of sat here looking around the house thinking how quiet it is. Honestly, you wouldn't believe it. I mean... I can't sit in this house without the radios on now. So now I'm turning radios and TVs on in every room just so that there's noise. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to take some getting used to. And I'm not saying that I won't get used to it because I will. Um, but for, for the um, initial couple of months, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to struggle. So I'm just hoping that the sun's going to start coming out so that I can be out in the garden and not be indoors. Um, and you never know, you know, maybe when I get through the first, the first month or so, I'll consider my stitching a comfort to know that he helped me stitch most of the things that I'm still stitching. So maybe I should try and look at it from that perspective. Who knows? But anyway, thank you all. And I'm, I am very sorry that it was such a sad video, but I'm sad. So I can't be happy when I'm sad. Um, and it may be a little while, I might go on a bit of a hiatus, but I was already sort of on one because of the build anyway. So I think it might just be a little extension, people. But I will be back at some point, but it just might take me a little while. So I wish you all well. I wish you all happiness and fun and that you're all getting some good weather and I thank you all for being such lovely people. So until next time, people, bye-bye for now.